project. So I, after a year of that, I, the second year I spent with the American Institute of Architects Urban Workshop in East Liberty, a, a distressed uh, neighborhood in uh, Pittsburgh. I lived in Shadyside, so I could walk to that, and I could also walk to Squirrel Hill, where the latest mass shooting of a synagogue took place. And I knew a lot of the people from Squirrel Hill who um, probably their children or grandchildren, because this was back in the 70s, and even possibly the architect uh, who was who created this for the Institute of Architects, the National Institute and local chapter, created this workshop, architects uh, workshop basically. And uh, he was uh, possibly a member of that synagogue, possibly still is, I haven't researched it. But this was, uh, we got very busy improving East Liberty, which I understand now is completely gentrified, <laughs> Uh, which is the flip side or downside of improving urban life. In fact, all of my historic preservation advocacy has resulted in historic properties becoming now so worth squillions of dollars that gentrification is a real problem. Our current mayor East, in Easton is working hard to try to prevent gentrification. I hope he finds a way. <laughs> Uh, we, myself, I got involved in developing properties later, urban properties that in Easton, as, uh, as a flipper who cared, I would only buy condemned buildings that had been vacant for maybe 20 or 30 years. I didn't want to displace anyone from any neighborhood, and but I would do a quick cosmetic, well, Earl, my husband, would do the quick cosmetic um, flip, upgrade, and then we would sell them to someone as a way of preserving. Because my first book, I'll get to later, was called Vanishing Ink. And that uh, was because all the historic buildings were worthless and vanishing left, right, and center, being demolished in front of my eyes. I'd go to do a sketch of one and it was gone. So I called it Vanishing Ink because that was the only um, respect people paid to historic buildings back then was um, to demolish them. <laughs> And there was a lot of federal money involved in demolishing, at my count, 64% of downtown Easton before I showed up in 1976 to find a way to stall it, stop it, and with others, got organized. And now look, <laughs> I feel very gratified that I can now enjoy being downtown, enjoying the rewards of the, that job well done. So where was I? Uh, I tend to digress in my old age. I'm retired and uh, a gentleman of leisure. So I have that, that, um, that state of mind, if I can call it that. So after, this is all before Easton, before I showed up in Easton, this history so far. So I worked in Pittsburgh and then uh, I enrolled at Berkeley for a graduate degree, and I was matriculating on Monday. I was supposed to show up Monday from Pittsburgh. My two-year contract was ending in Pittsburgh, and I thought, well, I'll go to Berkeley. The weather's better, I think. And I get this telegram, job is yours. What job? I called. I didn't understand a word they were saying. I couldn't understand their accent because it was Welsh. I had never been to Wales. And I was hired by a firm in Wales, you, uh, I had sent them a, an inquiry with my resume, oh, I think a year earlier, and uh, here I got the job. So I changed planes. The, the day I'm to fly, my father came over to send me off in Shadyside. Tomorrow this time you'll be in sunny California at Berkeley. I said, no, actually, I'll be in Wales, wherever that is. <laughs> and so I postponed my uh, graduate work at Berkeley for what I thought was going to be a one-year contract, and it turned out to be about mm, 20 years. So I went to Wales and worked for a firm that did the largest number of housing units in the United Kingdom, and I loved it. A small town in Porthcawl, about an hour from Cardiff, which is about three hours from London. And so every weekend I would take the train to London and had a secondary residence there, a, long, a standing reservation at a bed and breakfast in Kensington, England. And uh, I just loved working in Wales and the Welsh, and it was wonderful. And I worked on a project that 
was in a sense a mini new town. It was a new concept that I had developed. And they, uh, after I left, it was built, and they slavishly followed my design. It was wonderful, and they thought they were so excited by it, which is why they hired me, because they knew I was thinking outside the box, because I'm an American. They were recruiting American architects. Uh, a tip. Many countries still do want American architects, because we do think outside the box of most, if not all, other countries. And I've lived in those countries, some of them, so I know what's, why we're more creative here. <laughs> we have a total disrespect, which is very healthy, I think, for authority. <laughs> or thinking inside the box. We're free-thinking people, at least used to be. And most of us still are. Three-quarters didn't vote for our available people who could vote, did not vote almost three-quarters for our current uh, selected leader. So uh, I'm not going to get into politics, but I'm comforted to know the three quarters of everyone I look around and see who could vote chose to reject voting for this, what I think of as a, a one step from fascism, okay? Not to mention the dishonesty and the unethical stuff going on. And now we're learning a lot about it in courts where it counts. But I know I digress again. So I didn't go to Berkeley, I went to Wales, and that was pretty much it, so I thought, I'll just, uh, and yet, because I was going to London every weekend, I thought, I've got to live and work in London. This four-hour, one-way trip every weekend is wearing me out, not to mention the expense. So I did interviews. I took a month off. Yes, you get a month's vacation after the first year in the United Kingdom, at least at that time. And I got a month's reservation at this bed and breakfast, the Vicarage Gate. And I thought I'll spend a whole month interviewing. And I made a list of the favorite firms I'd like to work with. And the top of the list, and I lined up 17 interviews and through that month. So the top of the list was um, my favorite, and that was number one. I scheduled that first. And it was a long interview. And they offered me this fantastic position in this wonderful firm. And the work I did there was not just housing, but it was also uh, one of our clients was the King Edwards Hospital Fund, which is connected with the royal family and or even set up by them, I'm not sure. So they were doing this conference center, uh, building a new building in uh, Camden Town at the time. Uh, at the time. Our firm was in Russell Square, but the, the project was in Camden Town, which is a historic part of uh, London. It's all historic. <laughs> and I loved it. And they built this conference center uh, within the guidelines, the historic preservation guidelines of the neighborhood. And this massive, massive conference center plunked down behind two rows of Georgian townhouses from the well, in their case, I guess, 18th century, maybe early 19th century. And it was a real success. And it was about a six-story building sunk down into the ground. So it did not violate the aesthetics of that historic neighborhood. I love that. Uh, they even had to build a 10-foot thick moat, or bottom of a, a boat, I should say, to float this building on because... It was all quicksand in the undergrounds. Uh, subway lines were running this way, that way, and all the underground lines. It was quite a challenge engineering-wise, and I really enjoyed working on that project and others with that firm. So I was loving and living and working in England, and then I fell in love with an Australian. I didn't even know where Australia was, but his visa was expiring, and I said, well... I'll apply for a visa, and I'll, how long could it take? I'll, I'll go in as a tourist and uh, see if they'll let me stay. Wrong, I inquired at the embassy, uh, if I, or at the consulate, if I, uh, you know, if someone offers me a job in Australia, can I stay? Or do I have to do what I had to do in England and go back to my country of origin and apply for a visa and wait how long? 
um, you're inquiring about employment in Australia. I said, no, not really. I'm just saying, what if someone were to offer me a job? Could I take it or would I have to go back to the United States and get a visa from there to be able to go to, directly to Australia or not? We can't give you a tourist visa. You've inquired about employment, period, end of subject. I said, well, then give me some other kind of visa. What are the, there was a, you need, you would only qualify for a permanent residency visa. I said, okay, I'll take one of those. It took almost a year to get that visa. And once I got to Australia, I could see why. Everything's tightly controlled. And a lot of that tight control has to do with things I'm not all that happy about. As an American who likes diversity, let's just leave it at that. And yet, Australia is a continent bigger than the United States in land area, but smaller than Pennsylvania in population. So it's a very high quality of life and all this. I didn't know anything about it. In fact, when I got on the plane in London to fly out there, I said, I want a non-stop. I don't want a um, lot of take, you know, I want a direct flight, a non-stop. She, she, we don't have non-stops to London. I mean, to Perth from London. I said, well, and this was Air India, which I was my airline I preferred. Wonderful airlines flying back then, don't get me started, it was so fantastic. Meanwhile, uh, they said, no, uh, but we have a direct flight. I said, okay, direct, nonstop, same thing. Okay, I'll take it. Three days later, I'm still on a plane. And we're now somewhere around Singapore, over the Indian Ocean, wherever that is, in the dark. And I, it's an eight-hour flight. Every stop got farther apart by hours. And the last leg was about eight hours. And I said to the steward, because um, by then, I think we switched. No, it was still Air India. But he was an Australian steward. I said... Uh, have we been hijacked? You can tell me, because I left London on Wednesday, and this is Saturday, and we're still not in Perth. What? Where is this place? And he said, uh, mate, she'll be right, no worries. It's just far, mate. I'm going, well, it must be. I said, but I'm an American. I can really take it if you tell me we've been hijacked. We've been through worse things than that in this country. Whereas those coddle Australians, except for World War II and the Japanese, I don't know what they've been through. But they have a very tightly controlled society that I didn't know at the time. Had free health care, free education. Uh, you could get a graduate degree, a postgraduate degree for free. You have free dental care, free mental care. They wanted an educated uh, population and a healthy population. They even paid their citizens to travel Europe for either two years at uh, full pay or half pay, and one year at full pay. That's what my uh, intended boyfriend was uh, doing in London for two years. He was being subsidized by the government, I guess, to live there, because they wanted a well-traveled, educated population. Imagine that in the United States. We'll never get there. That's not to say there aren't many educated, well-traveled people with a very high quality of life in the United States. But it's not everyone across the board. In fact, they, Australia taxed the rich at 95% right off the top, no deductions. That's why all the Australians, the rich ones, Rupert Murdoch, uh, they come here. This is the Switzerland for uh, rich people who can then, of course, they can do what they want. They can, and as you can see with Fox News, FAUX and everything else, uh, they really do what they want and they love it. It's good, nice for them, but it's not so nice for everyone. Whereas Australia, if you're not super rich and forced out with these taxes, the, the standard of living is really upper, upper, upper middle class. And there's no poverty. I, I, there's no slums. There's no, at the time there was no crime. I said, I'm an American. Show me the worst. I've seen the best now. I've been here a year. Show me the worst. There is no worst. They don't know what you're talking about. And they come to the United States and they're truly stunned, speechless with the range of things one sees here. There, everything is just another perfect day in paradise, including the weather. Well, oh my goodness, I'm really over my time, and I won't be able to upload this. I'll have to cut this last part.